The Everlasting Man by G. K. Chesterton Book Two Chapter Three The Strangest Story in the World In the last chapter I have deliberately stressed what seems to be nowadays a neglected side of the New Testament story. But nobody will suppose, I imagine, that it is meant to obscure that side that may truly be called human. That Christ was, and is, the most merciful of judges, and the most sympathetic of friends, is a fact of considerably more importance in our own private lives than in anybody's historical speculations. But the purpose of this book is to point out that something unique has been swamped in cheap generalizations, and for that purpose it is relevant to insist that even what was most universal was also most original. For instance, we might take a topic which really is sympathetic to the modern mood, as the ascetic vocations recently referred to are not. The exaltation of childhood is really something that we can understand. But it was by no means a thing that was then, in that sense, understood. If we wanted an example of the originality of the Gospels, we could hardly take a stronger or a more startling one. Nearly two thousand years afterwards, we happen to find ourselves in a mood that does really feel the mystical charm of the child. We express it in romances and regrets about childhood, in Peter Pan or the Child's Garden of Verses. And we can say of the words of Christ, with so angry an anti-Christian as Swinburne, No sign that ever was given to faithful or faithless eyes showed ever beyond clouds riven so clear a paradise. Earth's creeds may be seventy times seven, and blood have defiled each creed. But if such be the kingdom of heaven, it must be heaven indeed. But that paradise was not clear until Christianity had gradually cleared it. The pagan world as such would not have understood any such thing as a serious suggestion that a child is higher or holier than a man. It would have seemed like the suggestion that a tadpole is higher or holier than a frog. To the merely rationalistic mind, it would sound like saying that a bud must be more beautiful than a flower, or that an unripe apple must be better than a ripe one. In other words, this modern feeling is an entirely mystical feeling. It is quite as mystical as the cult of virginity. In fact, it is the cult of virginity. But pagan antiquity had much more idea of the holiness of the virgin than of the holiness of the child. For various reasons, we have come nowadays to venerate children, perhaps partly because we envy children for still doing what men used to do, such as play simple games and enjoy fairy tales. Over and above this, however, there is a great deal of real and subtle psychology in our appreciation of childhood. But if we turn it into a modern discovery, we must once more admit that the historical Jesus of Nazareth had already discovered it two thousand years too soon. There was certainly nothing in the world around him to help him to the discovery. Here Christ was indeed human, but more human than a human being was then likely to be. Peter Pan does not belong to the world of Pan but to the world of Peter. Even in the matter of mere literary style, if we suppose ourselves thus sufficiently detached to look at it in that light, there is a curious quality to which no critic seems to have done justice. It had, among other things, a singular air of piling tower upon tower by the use of a, the a fortiori, making a pagoda of degrees like the seven heavens. 
I have already noted that almost inverted imaginative vision which pictured the impossible penance of the cities of the plain. There is perhaps nothing so perfect in all language or literature as the use of these three degrees in the parable of the lilies of the field, in which he seems first to take one small flower in his hand and note its simplicity and even its impotence, then suddenly expands it in flamboyant colors into all the palaces and pavilions full of a great name in national legend and national glory, and then, by yet a third overturn, shrivels into nothing once more with a gesture as if flinging it away. And if God so clothed the grass that to-day is and to-morrow is cast into the oven, how much more? It is like the building of a good babel tower by white magic in a moment and in the movement of a hand, a tower heaved suddenly up to heaven, on the top of which can be seen afar off higher than we had fancied possible, the figure of man, lifted by three infinities above all other things on a starry ladder of light logic and swift imagination. Merely in a literary sense it would be more of a masterpiece than most of the masterpieces in the libraries. Yet it seems to have been uttered almost at random, while a man might pull a flower but merely in a literary sense also, this use of the comparative in several degrees has about it a quality which seems to me to hint of much higher things than the modern suggestion of the simple teaching of pastoral or communal ethics. There is nothing that really indicates a subtle and, in the true sense, a superior mind so much as this power of comparing a lower thing with a higher, and yet that higher with a higher still, of thinking on three planes at once. There is nothing that wants the rarest sort of wisdom so much as to see, let us say, that the citizen is higher than the slave, and yet that the soul is infinitely higher than the citizen or the city. It is not by any means a faculty that commonly belongs to these simplifiers of the gospel, those who insist on what they call a simple morality, and others call a sentimental morality. It is not at all covered by those who are content to tell everybody to remain at peace. On the contrary, there is a very striking example of it in the apparent inconsistency between Christ's sayings about peace and about a sword. It is precisely this power which perceives that while a good peace is better than a good war, even a good war is better than a bad peace. These far-flung comparisons are nowhere so common as in the Gospels, and to me they suggest something very vast. So a thing solitary and solid with the added dimension of depth or height, might tower over the flat creatures living only on a plain. This quality of something that can only be called subtle and superior, something that is capable of long views and even of double meanings, is not noted here merely as a counterblast to the commonplace exaggerations of amiability and mild idealism. It is also to be noted in connection with the more tremendous truth touched upon at the end of the last chapter. For this is the very last character that commonly goes with mere megalomania, especially such steep and staggering megalomania as might be involved in that claim, this quality that can only be called intellectual distinction, is not, of course, an evidence of divinity but it is evidence of a probable distaste for vulgar and vainglorious claims to divinity. A man of that sort, if he were only a man, would be the last man in the world to suffer from that intoxication by one notion from nowhere in particular, 
which is the mark of the self-deluding sensationalist in religion. Nor is it even avoided by denying that Christ did make this claim. Of no such man as that, of no other prophet or philosopher of the same intellectual order, would it be even possible to pretend that he had made it. Even if the Church had mistaken his meaning, it would still be true that no other historical tradition except the Church had ever even made the same mistake. Mohammedans did not misunderstand Muhammad and suppose he was Allah. Jews did not misinterpret Moses and identify him with Jehovah. Why was this claim alone exaggerated, unless this alone was made? Even if Christianity was one vast universal blunder, it is still a blunder as solitary as the Incarnation. The purpose of these pages is to fix the falsity of certain vague and vulgar assumptions, and we have here one of the most false. There is a sort of notion in the air everywhere that all the religions are equal because all the religious founders were rivals, that they are all fighting for the same starry crown. It is quite false. The claim to that crown, or anything like that crown, is really so rare as to be unique. Confucius did not make it any more than Plato or Marcus Aurelius. Muhammad did not make it any more than Micah or Malachi. Buddha never said he was Brahma. Zoroaster no more claimed to be Ormuz than to be Ariman. The truth is that in the common run of cases, it is just as we should expect it to be, in common sense and certainly in Christian philosophy. It is exactly the other way. Normally speaking, the greater the man is, the less likely he is to make the very greatest claim. Outside the unique case we are considering, the only kind of man who ever does make that kind of claim is a very small man, a secretive or self-centered monomaniac. Nobody can imagine Aristotle claiming to be the father of gods and men come down from the sky, though we might imagine some insane Roman emperor like Caligula claiming it for him, or more probably, for himself. Nobody can imagine Shakespeare talking as if he were literally divine, though we might imagine some crazy American crank finding it as a cryptogram in Shakespeare's works, or preferably in his own works. It is possible to find here and there human beings who make this supremely superhuman claim. It is possible to find them in lunatic asylums, in padded cells, possibly in straight waistcoats. But what is much more important than their mere materialistic fate in our very materialistic society, under very crude and clumsy laws about lunacy, the type we know as tinged with this, or tending towards it, is a diseased and disproportionate type narrow yet swollen and morbid to monstrosity. It is by rather an unlucky metaphor that we talk of a madman as cracked, for in a sense he is not cracked enough. He is cramped rather than cracked. There are not enough holes in his head to ventilate it. This impossibility of letting in daylight on a delusion does sometimes cover and conceal a delusion of divinity. It can be found not among prophets and sages and founders of religions, but only among a low set of lunatics. But this is exactly where the argument becomes intensely interesting, because the argument proves too much. For nobody supposes that Jesus of Nazareth was that sort of person. No modern critic in his five wits thinks that the preacher of the Sermon on the Mount was a horrible half-witted imbecile 
that might be scrawling stars on the walls of a cell. No atheist or blasphemer believes that the author of the parable of the prodigal son was a monster with one mad idea, like a cyclops with one eye. Upon any possible historical criticism, he must be put higher in the scale of human beings than that. Yet, by all analogy, we have really to put him there, or else in the highest place of all. In fact, those who can really take it, as I here hypothetically take it, in a quite dry and detached spirit, have here a most curious and interesting human problem. It is so intensely interesting, considered as a human problem, that it is in a spirit quite disinterested, so to speak, that I wish some of them had turned that intricate human problem into something like an intelligible human portrait. If Christ was simply a human character, he really was a highly complex and contradictory human character for he combined exactly the two things that lie at the two extremes. He was exactly what the man with the delusion never is. He was wise. He was a good judge. What he said was always unexpected, but it was always unexpectedly magnanimous, and often unexpectedly moderate. Take a thing like the point of the parable of the tares and the wheat. It has the quality that unites sanity and subtlety. It has not the simplicity of a madman. It has not even the simplicity of a fanatic. It might be uttered by a philosopher a hundred years old at the end of a century of utopias. Nothing could be less like this quality of seeing beyond and all round obvious things than the condition condition of the egomaniac with the one sensitive spot on the brain. I really do not see how these two characters could be convincingly combined, except in the astonishing way in which the creed combines them. For until we reach the full acceptance of the fact as a fact, however marvelous all mere approximations to it are actually farther and farther away from it. Divinity is great enough to be divine. It is great enough to call itself divine. But as humanity grows greater, it grows less and less likely to do so. God is God, as the Moslems say. But a great man knows that he is not God, and the greater he is, the better he knows it. That is the paradox. Everything that is merely approaching to that point is merely receding from it. Socrates, the wisest man, knows that he knows nothing. A lunatic may think he is omniscient, and a fool may talk as if he were omniscient. But Christ is in another sense omniscient, if he not only knows, but knows that he knows. Even on the purely human and sympathetic side, therefore, the Jesus of the New Testament seems to me to have, in a great many ways, the note of something superhuman, that is, of something human and more than human. But there is another quality running through all his teachings which seems to me neglected in most modern talk about them as teachings, and that is the persistent suggestion that he has not really come to teach. If there is one incident in the record which affects me personally as grandly and gloriously human, it is the incident of giving wine for the wedding feast. That is really human in the sense in which a whole crowd of prigs, having the appearance of human beings, can hardly be described as human. It rises superior to all superior persons. It is as human as Herrick and as democratic as Dickens. But even in that story, there is something else that has that note of things not fully explained, 
and in a way here very relevant. I mean, the first hesitation, not on any ground touching the nature of the miracle, but on that of the propriety of working any miracles at all, at least at that stage. My time is not yet come. What does that mean? At least it certainly meant a general plan or purpose in the mind with which certain things did or did not fit in. And if we leave out that solitary strategic plan, we not only leave out the point of the story, but the story. We often hear of Jesus as, of Nazareth as a wandering teacher, and there is a vital truth in that view in so far as it emphasizes an attitude towards luxury and convention which most respectable people would still regard as that of a vagabond. It is expressed in his own great saying about the holes of the foxes and the nests of the birds, and like many of his great sayings, it is felt as less powerful than it is, through lack of appreciation of that great paradox by which he spoke of his own humanity as in some way collectively and representatively human, calling himself simply the son of man, that is, in effect, calling himself simply man. It is fitting that the new man, or the second Adam, should repeat in so ringing a voice and with so arresting a gesture the great fact which came first in the original story, that man differs from the brutes by everything, even by deficiency, that he is, in a sense, less normal and even less native, a stranger upon the earth. It is well to speak of his wanderings in this sense, and in the sense that he shared his drifting life, the drifting life of the most homeless and hopeless of the poor. It is assuredly well to remember that he would quite certainly have been moved on by the police, and almost certainly arrested by the police for having no visible means of subsistence. For our law has in it a turn of humor or touch of fancy, which Nero and Herod never happened to think of, that of actually punishing homeless people for not sleeping at home. But in another sense, the word wandering, as applied to his life, is a little misleading. As a matter of fact, a great many of the pagan sages, and not a few of the pagan sophists, might truly be described as wandering teachers. In some of them, their rambling journeys were not altogether without a parallel in their rambling remarks. Apollonius of Tiana, who figured in some fashionable cults as a sort of ideal philosopher, is represented as rambling as far as the Ganges and Ethiopia, more or less talking all the time. There was actually a school of philosophers called the Peripatetics, and most even of the great philosophers give us a vague impression of having very little to do except to walk and talk. The great conversations which give us our glimpses of the great minds of Socrates and, or Buddha or even Confucius often seem to be parts of a nev never-ending picnic, and especially, which is the important point, to have neither beginning nor end. Socrates did indeed find the conversation interrupted by the incident of his execution. But it is the whole point and the whole particular merit of the position of Socrates that death was only an interruption and an incident. We miss the real moral importance of the great philosopher if we miss that point, that he stares at the executioner with an innocent surprise and almost an innocent annoyance at finding anyone so unreasonable as to cut short a little conversation for the elucidation of truth. He is looking for truth, and not looking for death. Death is but a stone in the road which can trip him up. 
His work in life is to wander on the roads of the world and talk about truth forever. Buddha, on the other hand, did arrest attention by one gesture. It was the gesture of renunciation, and therefore, in a sense of denial, but by one dramatic negation he passed into a world of negation that was not dramatic, which he would have been the first to insist was not dramatic. Here again we miss the particular moral importance of the great mystic if we do not see the distinction, that it was his whole point that he had done with drama, which consists of desire and struggle, and generally of defeat and disappointment. He passes into peace, and lives to instruct others how to pass into it. Henceforth his life is that of the ideal philosopher, certainly a far more really ideal philosopher than Apollonius of Tiana, but still a philosopher in the sense that it is not his business to do anything, but rather to explain everything. In his case, we might almost say, mildly and softly, to explore everything. For the messages are basically different. Christ said, Seek first the kingdom, and all these things shall be added unto you. Buddha said, Seek first the kingdom, and then you will need none of these things. Now, compared to these wanderers, the life of Jesus went as swift and straight as a thunderbolt. It was above all things dramatic. It did, above all things, consist in doing something that had to be done. It emphatically would not have been done if Jesus had walked about the world forever doing nothing except tell the truth. And even the external movement of it must not be described as a wandering in the sense of forgetting that it was a journey. This is where it was a fulfillment of the myths rather than of the philosophies. It is a journey with a goal and an object, like Jason going to find the golden fleece, or Hercules the golden apples of the Hesperides. The gold that he was seeking was death. The primary thing that he was going to do was to die. He was going to do other things, equally definite and objective, we might almost say equally external and material. But from first to last, the most definite fact is that he is going to die. No two things could possibly be more different than the death of Socrates and the death of Christ. We are meant to feel that the death of Socrates was, from the point of view of his friends at least, a stupid muddle and miscarriage of justice interfering with the flow of a humane and lucid, I had almost said a light, philosophy. We are meant to feel that death was the bride of Christ, as poverty was the bride of St. Francis. We are meant to feel that his life was in that sense a sort of love affair with death, a romance of the pursuit of that ultimate sacrifice. From the moment when the star goes up like a birthday rocket to the moment when the sun is extinguished like a funeral torch, the whole story moves on wings with the speed and direction of a drama, ending in an act beyond words. Therefore, the story of Christ is the story of a journey, almost in the manner of a military march, certainly in the manner of the quest of a hero moving to his achievement or his doom. It is a story that begins in the paradise of Galilee, a pastoral and peaceful land, having really some hint of Eden, and gradually climbs the rising country into the mountains that are nearer to the storm clouds and the stars, as to a mountain of purgatory. He may have met, he may be met, as if straying in strange places, or stopped on the way for discussion or dispute but his face is set towards the mountain city. 
That is the meaning of that great culmination, when he crested the ridge and stood at the turning of the road and suddenly cried aloud, Lamenting over Jerusalem. Some light touch of that lament is in every patriotic poem, or if it is absent, the patriotism stinks with vulgarity. That is the meaning of the stirring and startling incident at the gate of the temple, when the tables were hurled like lumber down the steps, and the rich merchants driven forth with bodily blows. The incident that must be at least as much of a puzzle to the pacifist as any paradox about non-resistance can be to any of the militarists. I have compared the quest to the journey of Jason, but we must never forget that in a deeper sense it is rather to be compared to the journey of Ulysses. It was not only a romance of travel, but a romance of return, and of the end of a usurpation. No healthy boy reading the story regards the route of the Ithacan suitors as anything but a happy ending. But there are doubtless some who regard the route of the merchants and money-changers with that refined repugnance which never fails to move them in the presence of violence, and especially of violence against the well-to-do. The point here, however, is that all these incidents have in them a character of mounting crisis. In other words, these incidents are not incidental. When Apollonius, the ideal philosopher, is brought before the judgment seat of Domitian and vanishes by magic, the miracle is entirely incidental. It might have occurred at any time in the wandering life of the Tianian. Indeed, I believe it is doubtful in date as well as in substance. The ideal philosopher merely vanished and resumed his ideal existence somewhere else for an indefinite period. It is characteristic of the contrast, perhaps, that Apollonius was supposed to have lived to an almost miraculous old age. Jesus of Nazareth was less prudent in his miracles. When Jesus was brought before the judgment seat of Pontius Pilate, he did, he did not vanish. It was the crisis and the goal. It was the hour and the power of darkness. It was the supremely supernatural act of all his miraculous life that he did not vanish. The Everlasting Man by G. K. Chesterton Chapter, Book 2, Chapter 3, Part 2 Every attempt to amplify that story has diminished it. The task has been attempted by many men of real genius and eloquence as well as by only too many vulgar sentimentalists and self-conscious rhetoricians. The tale has been retold with patronizing pathos by elegant skeptics and with fluent enthusiasm by boisterous bestsellers. It will not be retold here. The grinding power of the plain words of the gospel story is like the power of millstones, and those who can read them simply enough will feel as if rocks had been rolled upon them. Criticism is only words about words, and of what use are words about such words as these? What is the use of word-painting about the dark garden filled suddenly with torchlight and furious faces? Are you come out with swords and staves as against a robber? All day I sat in your temple teaching, and you took me not. Can anything be added to the massive and gathered restraint of that irony, like a great wave lifted to the sky and refusing to fall? Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. As the high priest asked what further need he had of witnesses, we might well ask what further need we have of words. Peter, in a panic, repudiated him, and immediately the cock crew, 
And Jesus looked upon Peter, and Peter went out and wept bitterly. Has anyone any further remarks to offer? Just before the murder, he prayed for all the murderous race of men, saying, They know not what they do. Is there anything to say to that, except that we know as little as, as little what we say? Is there any need to repeat and spin out the story of how the tragedy trailed up the Via Dolorosa, and how they threw him in haphazard with two thieves in one of the ordinary batches of execution? And how, in all that horror and howling wilderness of desertion, one voice spoke in homage, a startling voice, from the very last place where it was looked for, the gibbet of the criminal. And he said to that nameless ruffian, This night shalt thou be with me in paradise. Is there anything to put after that but a full stop? Or is anyone prepared to answer adequately that farewell gesture to all flesh which created for his mother a new son? It is more within my powers, and here more immediately to my purpose, to point out that in that scene were symbolically gathered all the human forces that have been vaguely sketched in this story. As kings and philosophers and the popular element had been symbolically pres present at his birth, so they were more practically concerned in his death. And with that we come face to face with the essential fact to be realized. All the great groups that stood about the cross represent in one way or another the great historical truth of the time, that the world could not save itself. Man could do no more. Rome and Jerusalem and Athens and everything else were going down like a sea turned into a slow cataract. Externally, indeed, the ancient world was still at its strongest. It is always at that moment that the inmost weakness begins. But in order to understand that weakness, we must repeat what has been said more than once that it was not the weakness of a thing originally weak. It was emphatically the strength of the world that was turned to weakness, and the wisdom of the world that was turned to folly. In this story of Good Friday, it is the best things in the world that are at their worst. That is what really shows us the world at its worst. It was, for instance, the priests of a true monotheism and the soldiers of an international civilization. Rome, the legend, founded upon fallen Troy and triumphant over fallen Carthage, had stood for a heroism which was the nearest that any pagan ever came to chivalry. Rome had defended the household gods and the human decencies against the ogres of Africa and the hermaphrodite monstrosities of Greece. But in the lightning flash of this incident, we see great Rome, the imperial republic, going downward under her Lucretian doom. Skepticism has eaten away even the confident sanity of the conquerors of the world. He who is enthroned to say, what is justice, can only ask, what is truth? So in that drama which decided the whole fate of antiquity, one of the central figures is fixed in what seems the reverse of his true role. Rome was almost another name for responsibility. Yet he stands forever as a sort of rocking statue of the irresponsible. Man could do no more. Even the practical had become the impracticable. Standing between the pillars of his own judgment seat, a Roman had washed his hands of the world. There, too, were the priests of that pure and original truth that was behind all the mythologies like the sun behind clouds. It was the most important truth in the world, and even that could not save the world. 
Perhaps there is something overpowering in pure personal theism, like seeing the sun and moon and sky come together to form one staring face. Perhaps the truth is too tremendous when not broken by some intermediaries, divine or human. Perhaps it is merely too pure and far away. Anyhow, it could not save the world. It could not even conquer the world. There were philosophers who held it in its highest and noblest form, but they not only could not convert the world, but they never tried. You could no more fight the jungle of popular mythology with a private opinion than you could clear away a forest with a pocket knife. The Jewish, the Jewish priests had guarded it jealously, in the good and bad sense. They had kept it as a gigantic secret. As savage heroes might have kept the sun in a box, they kept the everlasting in a tabernacle. They were proud that they alone could look upon the blinding sun of a single deity, and they did not know that they themselves had gone blind. Since that day, their representatives have been like blind men in broad daylight, striking to right and left with their staffs and cursing the darkness. But there has been that in their monumental monotheism that it has at least remained like a monument the last thing of its kind, and in a sense motionless in the more restless world which it cannot satisfy. For it is certain that for some reason it cannot satisfy. Since that day it has never been quite enough to say that God is in his heaven and all is right with the world, since the rumor that God had left his heavens to set it right. And as it was with these powers that were good, or at least had once been good, so it was with the element which was perhaps the best, or which Christ himself seems certainly to have felt as the best. The poor to whom he preached the good news, the common people who held, heard him gladly, the populace that had made so many popular heroes and demigods in the old pagan world, showed also the weaknesses that were dissolving the world. They suffered the evils often seen in the mob of the city, and especially the mob of the capital, during the decline of a society. The same thing that makes the rural population live on tradition makes the urban population live on rumor. Just as its myths, at the best, had been irrational, so its likes and dislikes are easily changed by baseless assertion that is arbitrary without being authoritative. Some brigand or other was artificially turned into a picturesque and popular figure and run as a kind of candidate against Christ. In all this, we recognize the urban population that we know, with its newspaper scares and scoops. But there was present in this ancient population an evil more particular, peculiar to the ancient world. We have noted it already as the neglect of the individual, even of the individual voting the condemnation, and still more of the individual condemned. It was the soul of the hive, a heathen thing. The cry of this spirit also was heard in that hour. It is well that one man die for the people. Yet this spirit in antiquity, of devotion to the city and to the state, had also been, in itself and in its time, a noble spirit. It had its poets and its martyrs, men still to be honored forever. It was failing through its weakness in not seeing the separate soul of a man, the shrine of all mysticism. But it was only failing as everything else was failing. The mob went along with the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the philosophers and the moralists. It went along with the imperial magistrates and the sacred priests, the scribes and the soldiers, that the one universal human spirit might suffer a universal condemnation, that there might be one 
deep unanimous chorus of approval and harmony when man was rejected of men. There were solitudes beyond, where none shall follow. There were secrets in the inmost and invisible part of that drama that have no symbol in speech, or in any severance of a man from men. Nor is it easy for any words less stark and single-minded than those of the naked narrative even to hint at the horror of exaltation that lifted itself above the hill. Endless expositions have not come to the end of it, or even to the beginning. And if there be any sound that can produce a silence, we may surely be silent about the end and the extremity. When a cry was driven out of that darkness in words dreadfully distinct and dreadfully unintelligible, which man shall never understand in all the eternity that they have purchased for him. And for one annihilating instant, an abyss that is not for our thoughts, had opened even in the unity of the absolute. And God had been forsaken of God. They took the body down from the cross, and one of the few rich men among the first Christians obtained permission to bury it in a rock tomb in his garden. The Romans setting a military guard, lest there should be some riot and attempt to recover the body. There was once more a natural symbolism in these natural proceedings. It was well that the tomb should be sealed with all the secrecy of ancient eastern sepulture, and guarded by the authority of the Caesars. For in that second cavern, the whole of that great and glorious humanity which we call antiquity was gathered up and covered over, and in that place it was buried. It was the end of a very great thing called human history, the history that was merely human. The mythologies and the philosophies were buried there, the gods and the heroes and the sages, in the great Roman phrase, they had lived. But as they could only live, they, so they could only die. And they were dead. On the third day, the friends of Christ, coming at daybreak to the place, found the grave empty and the stone rolled away. In varying ways, they realized the new wonder. But even they hardly realized that the world had died in the night. What they were looking at was the first day of a new creation, with a new heaven and a new earth. And in a semblance of the gardener, God walked again in the garden, in the cool not of the evening, but the dawn. End of chapter 3 of Book 2